Welcome back to the show. Today's episode is sponsored by Athletic Greens. They are giving you one year free supply of vitamin D along with five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is go to athleticgreens.com slash insane. That is athleticgreens.com slash insane. Enjoy the show. This episode contains content that may be disturbing to some viewers. My name is Erica and I was groomed as a child. So I grew up in a suburban area in Pennsylvania, and my family was pretty middle class. Like, I had a pretty happy family. Um, I had a small friend group, but it was all good. Um, I would say my earliest memories go back to, like, when I was eight. Mm -hmm. So starting from then, all I remember is just happy family life. Um, Did you have siblings? I had two older sisters, yeah, okay. and I had really good relationships with them. Got it. And your mom and dad were together. That's yeah, okay. exactly. Um, but as the years went by, probably around like age 10, like some depression started creeping in and some anxiety. And that's pretty young to yeah. experience that. So um, I feel like that's when I kind of relied on online forums and like, online writing groups to try to like get some friends and get some social support and stuff Mm -hmm. like that. So that's when I began sort of isolating myself from my family, I'd say. Um, I don't know if anybody knows the site, but it's called Quodev or Quizaz. Have you heard of that? (laughs) Okay. So it's where you like post like fan fictions or like short stories. Okay. Um, I was really into like the dark stuff. So I would post um, some horror stories that I was into and I got a really good community of people. So that kind of helped me a little bit. Um, But then my mother actually found like one of my stories and she was like, oh, this is a bit dark. Like, I don't think somebody at your age should be writing this. So you were 10 at this time. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that's when I got my computer wiped for the first time and that made me feel like even more isolated. Yeah. Cause like that was kind of taken away from you. Exactly. Okay. That was like my whole friend group. Yeah. And like your outlet time. in a way. Yeah. And do you, do you know where like the depression was coming from at this point or it was kind of like random and sudden? Yeah. I would say that like I had no clue where. Okay. I know that there's some mental illness on both sides of my family, so I feel like there was probably just a genetic like predisposition, right? Genetic predisposition um, to that, but yeah, I can't say it was anything to do with my environment. So okay. it's probably just something that I had coming towards me, anyways. Right. Um, but yeah, so after I got that kind of support system taken away from me, um, life was really hard for a few months. And that's when I discovered the wonderful site Omegle. Omegle. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So um, all my friends were kind of on it at the time. Um, and if anybody still doesn't know what it is, it's like a video chat site where you're basically randomly assigned to meet with another human being. They could be across the world. They could be in your city or yeah. anything. Um So me and my friends from school, we would go on Omegle uh, for like hours and we would usually like be paired up with like other older men and stuff like that. And at the time, we were just pretty naive about it. So it was kind of just something where we could get that validation to like feel um, like we are prettier, like we were actually like. I don't know, something special because, of course, the old men are going to tell that to you. Um, So that soon became like an addiction and a pastime for me. I was on there for like hours every single day, Mm -hmm. um, just constantly talking to these older men um, who were providing me with like validation that my parents weren't giving me at the time. Um, And so this was like from 10 to 12 that I was doing this. Um. And so one day when I was 12, I got paired with like a black screen, Mm -hmm. which is pretty common on there because people don't have to show their faces. Right. So um, I was about to like exit out of it. Um, 
And then I got a message through the site and it said something like, I can see that you have a certain sadness in your eyes. And I was like, oh, like somebody can see that I'm like Mm -hmm. depressed, which was pretty uncommon at the time because nobody could really see that I was sad except for me. Um, So yeah, I just felt really like seen in that moment. And so I continued talking to this person, whoever they were, and a common thing on Omegle then was to send like your age, sex, and location, like right when you got paired up with somebody. So I was like, I'm a female, I'm 12 years old, and I live in Pennsylvania. And they were like, oh, I'm an older male who lives in California. And I was like, how old are you? And they didn't say at that time point. So I just assumed they were older. But um, we continued just having like a really good conversation. So then later that night, I think that I texted him first. I don't know what order it was. But um, we got to talking really late at night. And um, we started talking about like more kind of fringe stuff, I guess. Um, He was asking me like my opinions on traditional like 1950s relationships so that would be like when the man has more of a patriarchal stance to the woman like he kind of has all of the responsibilities in the relationships and also all the rights and the woman is just kind of there um cooking and providing like sexual services to her husband basically and like at this age do you think that you like really like understood what he was asking or did it was it just kind of like not that deep to you yeah I didn't understand at all what he was talking about right this was like all new to me at this time because Mm -hmm. I was so young so I was asking a lot of questions back to him like what do you mean right and um yeah just like I don't know what you're talking about basically so he basically got a lot of joy out of that He was always excited, like, when I was telling him I hadn't had my first kiss yet, I hadn't had my first boyfriend yet, like, I hadn't lost my virginity yet. He would always get really excited over text and be like, oh, that's perfect because it's better for a woman to, like, keep her virginity until she's older because then her husband can train her in the way that's, like, ideal to him. Whereas maybe another girl who had more like sexual experiences would kind of have her own idea what she likes Mm -hmm. sexually. So um, he was really pleased with me at that point. And while all of it was like very jarring to me, I didn't really, I guess I was just um, like I was starved for affection. Like I just wanted him to like me. And it was the first person who had, treated me like I was something special right so even though I knew something was a little bit wrong um I just basically continued with it yeah and it seems like it was you know it was filling some sort of void within you exactly feeding something that you were lacking like you said Mm -hmm. so I think at this point I told like my school friends that I was talking to somebody and they were older Mm -hmm. and they were very disapproving of the relationship Because while we all did, like, the Omegle thing and, like, met with guys online through that video chatting, like, none of them had taken it the step where now they're, like, individually chatting with somebody. More personal. Mm -hmm. So they were really worried for me. And that's when my school friends started to distance themselves from me, which, of course, just, like, pushed me farther into his arms. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, I would talk to him every day, like, hours all through text. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, there was some like phone calls and like a few weeks down the line, we got into Skype calls. Mm-hmm. So he started by basically um, giving opinions on the way I dressed. So I would have to send him pictures of what I was wearing to school and he would usually say something like, um, oh, you shouldn't wear a bra with that or you shouldn't wear... Um, that sweater over top of it. He just wanted me to dress more provocatively and like see the responses that I would get from it. Mm -hmm. Um, Because his ultimate goal was just to like get me more used to um, like explicit stuff and stuff like that. Yeah. 
yeah. Um, so after that, he also started monitoring what I ate because at that point, like I was a normal weight, but he wanted me to be skinnier and he wanted me to start working out. So my body would look different. Um, so I would have like an exercise regimen. I would have a certain diet I had to eat. And then he would also have to give approval for everything I wore to school. And that's when like the Skype call started picking up. And that was more frequent, maybe like every three days or so. Do you think that at this time your parents picked up on like the exercising and diet stuff or not real? Or did you keep that kind of like to yourself? They definitely noticed that I wasn't coming down for dinner as much anymore. Okay. Um, but I think they just kind of thought it was normal like adolescent stuff right. where you just are worried about how you look basically. They mm-hmm. didn't know that I was talking to him. So they didn't know that I was being directed by somebody else. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So after that, um, I feel like he started to progress in what he wanted from me. So when we'd get on Skype calls together, he would usually want me to like take off my clothes for him. And if I didn't do it in the right way, I'd have to redo it. So um, it was like the most attractive, like a porn star basically. Um, And then he would progressively like get me more towards um, masturbating in front of him Mm -hmm. and directing me on how to do that properly. And, like, this was when I was 13 or 14, so I had obviously never done that before. So at this point, were you guys talking for, like, a couple years now? No, it okay. was, like, all a matter of a couple months. Okay, got it. And you were yeah. 13 or 14. Okay. So I met him at 13. Okay, Um, it. And then at, I guess, 14, mm-hmm. around there is, like, when things started to progress in the relationship. Okay. And he started getting into more of the grooming behaviors. So... At that point, I was having, like, these masturbation sessions on Skype with him every other day. And then he started to implement this thing where I would have to listen to these, like, audio soundtracks when I would go to bed. That would basically just be messages of... um, basically misogynistic messages that would just constantly be played. And I was meant to listen to them two hours before I went to bed all the way through the night and then two hours after I woke up. So for like 12 hours, I'd be listening to a message just over and over again. Um, Usually it'd be something like women are below men women are meant to serve men, women are meant to sexually pleasure men, and just like all sorts of variations of that. Mm -hmm. And so basically, like he wanted you to actually start believing those things. Yeah, he was um, in the military originally. And he would always tell me stories about like, the psychological tactics they used in the military. I at this time didn't know if any of this was true. But like, That's what I'm thinking he took, like, inspiration from in terms of how he tried to brainwash me Mm -hmm. and psychologically manipulate me. So after only, like, a few weeks of that, I feel like I started to actually believe those Mm -hmm. messages. And would he ever show you himself on Skype or was he always just, like, sitting and watching you? Yeah. So over text, he started to show me some pictures of him. And he was more forthcoming about being, I think at the time he was 45 Mm -hmm. and I was 14. And he also had a wife at the time. Um, And he told me all of that in a couple weeks of texting. Um, But as for the Skype calls, he would always have like a black screen. Okay. So only your camera was on. Yeah, exactly. You don't really know what he was doing. No. And... He would usually record the Skype sessions, like, so he could watch them back later. Um, I remember one time he accidentally did it on his work computer. He recorded it. So it was, like, this huge thing. And that's why I know that he was recording me because he got really upset about that. Um, And usually when he would get upset at me, like, there'd be different, like, punishments and stuff. Um, 
like sometimes I'd have to send him a picture of me hurting myself or I would have to um, just not talk to him for an extended period of time because he knew that like his affection and his um, attention was like the most important thing to me. Yeah. Yeah. So after like these behaviors of his were escalating and he was getting more and more strict with what I was allowed to do and not allowed to do, he started floating the idea that um, he wanted to meet me because he wanted to see how effective his training was so far and he wanted to see like my worth basically thus far. Um, So he lived in California at that time and his wife didn't know about our relationship. So his plan was that he was going to come to Pennsylvania on a business trip. And that made sense because he did have like um, businesses all across the country at that point. So it wouldn't be that suspicious if he told his wife that. Um, He didn't have kids, right? No, No. he didn't have kids. Um, So at that point, um, he basically was like talking me through what I would need to do to be prepared for when he came. So the first thing was that I had to book like a taxi company because I obviously couldn't drive and I needed to get to the hotel that we were planning to meet at. So I had really bad anxiety at that point of my life. So like thinking about calling a taxi company was like the worst thing in my mind. Dude, what was your plan as far as your parents went? Like what were you going to tell them? Yeah. So that's what he instructed me on too. Yeah. He basically gave me a script of what to tell my parents. Um that I was at one of my friend's birthday parties, basically. Yeah. Okay. So I booked the taxi and I told my parents that I was going to have a birthday party on that day or my friend was going to have a mm-hmm. birthday party. Um, and then so the day came. Um, my parents were both at work and uh, the taxi company called me and said that they were outside my house. So I go outside, I get in the cab, and the taxi driver kind of gives me a strange look because Mm -hmm. I'm really young to be in a cab by myself, especially when it's going to a hotel. Were you nervous to meet him? Yeah, I was really nervous because it was all like almost going to become real. Right, exactly. It was like coming to life. Were you excited at all to meet him or was it more like nerves, would you say? I think it was a mixture. I was excited, but I was also nervous. Okay. Um, Just because at this point, I thought we were just going to kind of like talk. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that didn't end up being what happened. But yeah, I was excited for what I thought it was going to be. So yeah, anyways, they drive me to the hotel. And he basically instructed me that when I get to the receptionist, I'm supposed to tell the receptionist that I'm blank's friend. And... When I tell them that, then they'll give me like a key card to the hotel that he had booked. So I told the receptionist and she didn't even like blink. Like she was not phased at all, Mm -hmm. which looking back on it is really disappointing to me because I feel like there should have been some suspicion. A little bit of a red flag, right? Did she ask for any information or just kind of was like she just gave you the card? No, I just said his name and then she gave me the card. Nothing that she needed from me, Mm -hmm. which was crazy. Um, And he also had told me like what I was supposed to wear that day. So he told me that I was supposed to wear leggings, um, a white tank top that was see-through without a bra, and then like my school jacket. So like it would have been clear to the receptionist that I was like in high school. Mm -hmm. Um, But anyways, yeah, so then I go up to the hotel room And he already had his stuff there, but he was at like a business meeting. So I was kind of just in the room by myself. And that's when I started to get some more nerves because I could see all of his like bags there. And I was like, like something really bad could happen Mm -hmm. if this goes awry. So I decided to look in his bags to see if there was anything like a gun or like restraints that would be super like off-putting to me. Um, 
there ended up being nothing in the bags. And so I texted him that I was there in the hotel room. So he should have been there in about like 15 minutes. But that's not how things happened. Um, I was waiting for about three to four hours. Just sitting in the hotel room. Yeah, just sitting on the couch with my nerves like completely crazy. Mm -hmm. Um, And at like the fourth hour, he texted me that he had just parked down below. So at this point, I'm like, my heart's beating so fast. I am hyperventilating, um, just really, really nervous. And about two minutes later, the door like swings open and like the look on his face when he walked in was just like pure annoyance at me. Like he was absolutely infuriated and he kind of just like, spit in my direction, like, why are your clothes on? Like, just very surprised and upset. Um, And at that point, I was just confused and speechless because I didn't know that I wasn't supposed to have my clothes on. Plus, you were waiting four hours. Yeah, exactly. Like, I was kind of annoyed at that point. But anyways, he said that he was going to take a quick shower. And by the time he was out of the shower... I had better have all my clothes off or he was never going to speak to me again and he didn't want to ever see me again. And he was saying all this like pretty like stern. Yeah. And it's important to note he was like 6'3", like a very muscular dude. Like so hearing that is very intimidating Mm -hmm. for me as a 14-year-old. Um So he got in the shower and I was shaking on the couch and I just decide to follow what he said because I didn't really see a way out for myself unless I just followed what he said. Um, And he also told me that when he got out of the shower, I needed to be with my knees on the couch, like facing away from him. Like that's the position he wanted me in. Um... So I took off all my clothes. I got on the couch in the position he wanted me to. And I hear him get out of the shower and open the bathroom door. And I can kind of hear the footsteps behind me. And that's when I'm like really anxious. Um, But so the first thing I feel is he has like a sex toy that he's trying to put in my ass so it was like an anal plug that he was trying to insert inside me and I immediately pulled away because I was just so confused and so surprised and instantly he slaps me um like in the face no in in the ass basically yeah because I was facing away from him okay um so yeah he slaps me and says like not to pull away from him Um, and I'm pretty like dissociated at that point. So I just kind of stay there and he proceeds with just like inserting it. Um, and it's really painful because obviously I wasn't prepared for it. It was very traumatizing. Um, and then a few minutes later, he tells me to get down on my knees. And so I'm kneeling in front of him and he tells me that I need to perform oral sex on him. Um, I had never done anything like that. I've never even kissed somebody. Um, so I instantly tell him no. And he punches me straight across the face and says, I hope I didn't hear you say that word because he hates the word no. I was never allowed to say that word. So I'm on my side and my ears like ringing at this point, um, And I realize it's not an option for me to say that. So he basically takes me by like the back of my hair, like kind of like grips onto the back of my hair and just forces me to perform oral sex on him. Um, Then after a few minutes of that, he like throws me on the bed and he anally rapes me. So... At that point, my heart just like completely breaks and like mentally I just detach. 
So I can't even like when I'm thinking about this, like I'm not even there fully. I kind of see it in like a third person point of view Um, because, yeah, I just completely dissociated. So I know it like went on for a fair bit of time, but eventually he um, finished and he went to the bathroom, got a towel, like cleaned everything up. And I was just laying on the bed and he kind of like yells at me like, why, why don't you want to cuddle me? Like, why don't you want to come up here and cuddle me? Mm-hmm. And at that point, I wasn't really feeling any emotions. So I just did what he said. And he tried to make small talk about how I was doing in my high school classes. And um, within like three minutes, I basically got up and was putting my clothes on, just telling him that I wanted to leave. Um During all this, were you, did you ever like cry or you were just completely like kind of shut off from it? Yeah, I just had no emotions. Got it. Like I was completely speechless and also just like confused. And I'm sure you were in pain. Yeah, I was in pain. I felt betrayed. I also felt isolated because I couldn't tell my friends about this. They already disapproved of him. I couldn't tell my family about this because. They also didn't know anything that was happening. So I felt that anything that happened in that moment was my fault and something that I needed to deal with on my own. So, yeah, I think that's, like, when I really started using, like, dissociation as, like, a coping mechanism for my feelings because I just couldn't handle them anymore. So I started getting ready to leave and... He was okay with that because I think he was just, like, happy that he was able to finish and everything. Yeah, got what he wanted. Yeah, exactly. He didn't argue. Um, I started walking to the door, and he grabbed me by my arm and said, give me a kiss goodbye, and kind of just, like, forced me to kiss him before I left. So that had been my first kiss, and then that had also basically been, like, my virginity that he took. Um. So as I was going down the elevator, down to the hotel lobby, I started crying. Mm -hmm. Like that's when all the emotions started flooding me. Um, And I remember walking through the hotel lobby and the receptionist was like trying to like avoid my gaze. Um, And he had called a taxi for me. So the taxi was waiting for me. I went in the taxi and the driver was like, instantly asking me what's wrong what happened like are you okay um and I just kind of played it off like oh I'm fine like I have allergies like something silly like that um and I told him to drop me off at my elementary school because that was a couple blocks from my house so I figured that within those couple blocks I could kind of like regain my composure for when I had to see my family um So he dropped me off at the elementary school, which he really didn't want to do because it was completely empty and he was confused, like, why do you want me to drop you off here? Um, But I kind of just told him there was a school event there Um, and I started walking home and that's when I called um, my abuser, I guess, Um, and... I was basically just crying and asking him what to do because I couldn't like suppress my feelings anymore. And I was worried that my parents were going to find out like what happened and what he did to me. Um, And he just started screaming at me through the phone and telling me that I need to stop crying because they were going to figure it out if I kept crying. So he hung up and I like wiped my tears, tried to fix my makeup and I eventually walked through into my house and my family was all sitting down like eating pizza together and they were like laughing and having so much fun and I just like yelled to them like oh I'll be down in a couple minutes and I raced up to my room and when I was in my room I saw that like I had a bruise on my face from when he punched me so I quickly like covered it up with makeup and then I went down to my parents 
and started telling them how I had such a good time at my friend's birthday party. After that incident, um, he basically continued to progress, like the training that he wanted me to go through. So um, in addition to everything that I was doing before, um, he also wanted me to begin to see other men. So he made me uh, sign up for three different websites. One of the websites was more, or I guess I'll just say, (laughs) um, the first website was Tumblr. So he made me sign up for Tumblr and he would make me post naked photos of myself. And then in the description, I would say, if you like this photo, go to this wish list. And were your face in these pictures? No, they weren't. Okay. So that was always like a hard limit for me and Mm -hmm. him because his like aspirations for me was to be his live-in slave, as he would call it. So he wanted me to live with him and his wife and basically just function as a sex slave for him and his wife. Um, But the wife didn't know at this time, right? Or do you think no, she did? No, but it became clear in like a little bit okay. into the story. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, the first website was Tumblr and he'd make me post pictures without my face. Um, and different men would go onto my wish list and they would buy the sex toys that he would tell me to put on the wish list because he basically wanted me to train up to being able to take like bigger and bigger sizes, um, not only anally, but vaginally too. And yeah, so um, the next website was more like BDSM related. So I would also post the same photos on there. And it was kind of like a Facebook, but for like BDSM purposes. Um, And I got popular on there like very, very quickly. So like thousands and probably tens of thousands of people were following me on there. Um, And then the third website was more oriented towards men who wanted to pay to like have the company of different people. So on that website is where I met primarily the majority of the men that I then saw. Um, So he would tell me like, oh, you should meet up with three men this week and they should all pick you up at your high school. You should skip the last period of class and um, get in the car and they'll take you to a location. And then you have to showcase like how good your training was. Our sponsor for today's episode is Athletic Greens. I love AG1 not only because of its great taste, but also because of the way it makes me feel. I start my mornings with one scoop of AG1 and I am feeling refreshed, motivated, full of energy and ready to start my day, whether that be work or the gym. AG1 is also perfect for those who are super busy in the mornings, always in a rush, trying to get out of the door as fast as possible because they offer the travel packs, which you can literally just leave in your car, Do the same thing as you would with the normal scoop. Just mix it in your water bottle and you are good to go. We should all be treating our bodies like it's a house that we have to live in forever. That being said, AG1 is the perfect way to start your day, treat your body right, and also just feel better in general. I gave AG1 a try because I wanted to start my mornings off with energy and mental clarity without having to drink coffee or an unhealthy energy drink. And AG1 has been the perfect healthy solution for me. So that being said, if you're looking for an easier way to take your supplements, Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com slash insane. That is athleticgreens.com slash insane. Check it out. So he wanted you to be having sex with these men. Yeah, exactly. Did he want it like filmed or anything or he just would want to hear about it from you? He would want me filming afterwards, but he didn't want me to film during because he thought it would be a deterrent to like the men. for sure. Yeah, so one of the first times I ever did it – the man picked me up at the library of my school and I had skipped last period to see him. Um, 
And then we went to a Starbucks where he like bought me a tea and was asking like how old I was. And at that point, I think I was like freshly 15 and he was really into that. Um, So these were all like older men. Yeah, they were like in their 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, Yeah, and they would just take me to different locations. Um, Would they pay you? No, not at that point. Okay, so it was just like meeting up. Okay, got it. Yeah, exactly. Um, Yeah, and usually what they would meet up for, it would be like oral sex. Um, And then they would always try to pressure me to do more. Um, But usually I wouldn't do anything more than oral sex at that point. Um, So that obviously wouldn't have like pleased um, my abuser. So Mm -hmm. I would tell him that I had sex like five times that week with different men. Right. When I really only like had oral sex with one or something like that. And that would keep him pretty happy. Um, And so, yeah, things just continued like that for about two years. So from like 14 to 16, I was just posting on these websites, seeing various different men every week, um, as well as like, abiding by his other rules and um the skype sessions were like training me to like deep throat and like deep throat for like two hours or something like that like very just intense things so yeah at 16 is when i met him for the second time he came back for business again um the same deal the same hotel i just did everything the same um but that time he raped me vaginally so he took my virginity in a different way so he just wanted to like be the first of everything basically um and that time ended really badly because I was kind of getting more argumentative to him during that time when we were at the hotel room um and he kind of led me to believe that he had a lot of other young girls that were doing the same things as me and he was operating under the logic that if I wasn't completely compliant with everything he asked me to do, then why did he even want to bother with me? Mm -hmm. He was just going to dispose of me and kind of move on to the other girls who were more submissive towards him. And at this point, do you think you were still reliant on like him and his attention, even though it was like, okay. Yeah, I definitely was because I was just like the black cat in my family. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I wasn't getting a lot of attention from my friends because they had all completely cut off ties with me because at that point, rumors were going around at school that I was a slut and nobody really wanted anything to do with me. They just thought um, that I was gross and stuff like that. So yeah, the second time was pretty bad. Um, And at that point, he started to use external manipulation to try to make me comply with him so he told me that every time I said no to him or disobeyed him he was gonna send me a video of him abusing his wife and the first time (laughs) that I did that um he sent the video he sent me a video of his wife in a complete mask except for her mouth And he was just completely degrading her, spitting on her, punching her. Um, And at the end of the video, like, he seemed to rape her, like, without her consent. So, And this was all, like, your fault, according to him. Yes, exactly. That's what was happening because of what I did. So as a 16-year-old, like, I felt completely like it was my responsibility because I didn't really have those decision-making skills Mm -hmm. and I didn't really understand what he was doing to me. Um, So I kind of just fell back into line. I started obeying him more and more and more and just doing whatever he wanted me to do. We were in the same like happy space, Um, but it was very apparent to me that he had um, a hierarchy of other girls and while I was like high up on the hierarchy, like he would always warn me that there was somebody who's doing the tasks better than me. And he would send me pictures of the girls that were doing things better than me and saying 
Like, you should be doing this. Why aren't you doing this task like I want you to? And so on. Um, It was at this point that he also wanted me to start, like, recruiting other girls from my high school. So I immediately was like, no to that (laughs) because I... I knew what it, what bad it had caused in my life and I wasn't about to like put that on somebody else. So I created like a couple of other numbers on my phone and I would text him from them, those numbers and send like pictures from off the web, like pretending to be other people. So he wouldn't want me to like recruit more people. He thought that I had already like gotten two new girls and he was happy with that. Um... So later that year, um, I was meeting up with one of the men that he had instructed me to see, and my mother called the friend's house that she thought I was at, and um, my friend was like, no, she's not here, and everybody started to get really worried, Um, and that's when my mother called the police. So... um, Like about like three in the morning, I looked at my phone because I had been with this man the entire night. And when I looked at the phone, there was like 72 missed calls, all from my mother and my father or my sisters and everything like that. Um, And that's when I realized that they had called the police. Um, Apparently, my dad had been like in a fatal car crash is what I saw on my phone. Um, so I immediately told the guy that I needed to come home and when I got home, I realized it was a lie. My dad was fine, but that's what the police had instructed my mother to tell me in order to get me back home because they thought that I'd like run off to be with some guy. My mother and my father wiped my phone. They wiped my computer because through calling the police, they had discovered that I was talking to all these different men that were much older than me, and they didn't really want me doing that. So they wiped my phone, and that's when I alerted, like, my abuser that this was going on, and he completely cut ties with me at that point. So I haven't spoken to him since then. Wow. Mm -hmm. I had been on the track in my high school to finish high school year early because that's what he wanted me to do. He wanted me to get out there as soon as I could. Um, so it was around like my 17th birthday or something at that point, And I was getting ready to finish high school. Um, and that's when my parents announced that they were going to divorce. So that was kind of just like the cherry on top of everything that I was going through. Um, yeah, it was a really rough time because I had always relied on him for my social support, and now I was going through something really big with my family, and I couldn't even reach out to him to kind of, like, ease that pain. Did you still have his number, or, like, because they wiped your phone, you didn't even... So, I still did have his number mm-hmm. because at that point I had memorized it. Um, they wiped my phone, I got a new number, but, yeah, I tried to reach out to him from, like, what I had memorized um but just from like how the texts were going through like um I think he probably took away that number okay yeah so I was just never able to contact him again after that Mm -hmm. um but yeah so my parents separated and I was going off to college and I chose to go to college in Canada so that was like just a complete break from my family. I really wanted like more independence and stuff like that. Um, I still had all the three like websites operational that like he wanted me to use. So I was still getting a lot of like men messaging me through there. I do have a question. When all Mm -hmm. of this happened with your parents and the cops, did your parents have like a sit down talk with you about everything that had been going on? Or like, did you not even have to like explain everything that had happened up to that moment. Yeah, they did. Um, They thought I was kind of in the dark about it. Like, they had printed out all my phone records, and they were like... So they knew about this man? They knew at that moment. Like, that was the first time they found out I was talking to him. And did you tell them, like, 
how you met him and the age difference and all of like all of that information or were you kind of vague with them about it? So on like the phone records that they saw, it was kind of like um, a white pages report. So they see all the ages okay, and they see kind of the locations where they're at. Um, so they did see that the majority of people in my phone contacts were older men mm -hmm. and they thought that I thought that they were all like boys my age. Okay. So they thought that I was just like being scammed or something on the internet and that I thought I was talking to boys my age. So you didn't ever really explain to them at this moment what really had happened? No, I okay. just completely kept them in the dark okay. because – that's what I was trained to do at that point. Like right. he said that if it ever came up to my parents, I wouldn't be able to tell them. Okay. Or like he would kill my family type okay. of thing. Like he would just use threats like that to kind okay. of keep me away from telling them. So yeah, I went to Canada and um, I got in a dorm room with another girl. And that was the first time that I ever had to like live in the same room as somebody. So that already was starting to feel very like claustrophobic to me. Um, and that's when I started to go on the one website where men would kind of pay money for like your company and stuff like that. Um, I would do that a lot more. So I started meeting up with these men like almost daily. Like it was pretty high frequency. And I wasn't going to any of my classes at this point. Um, but I was still doing okay academically because I was still studying. I just wasn't going to like classes. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, most of those people were pretty fine actually. Like there was no significant stories from that. I would say I was like turning 18. Um, and the day I turned 18, I went to a therapist's office because that was the first time that I wanted to get like mental health services um, because I knew that if you're 18, they didn't need like your parents' consent and they wouldn't tell anybody anything of what you said. Um, so I went to a sexual trauma therapist and he started like working through some of the issues that were going on from like my childhood and stuff that was going on there. But like as many people know, therapy is like really slow moving. So even though I started going to my therapist, um, I also started getting into like the BDSM community in where I was living. Um, so on that website that I was using, um, I met this man who was very well known in that town and he was very popular and I didn't know it at the time, but he had a reputation for finding like the youngest girls, the newest girls to the community and kind of exploiting them for his own personal gain. So um, at that point, I'm talking to him. He wants to arrange um, a meetup. And I think I took like a Greyhound bus like two hours to go meet him because he was like in a different part of Canada than I was in. Um, and you met him through the BDSM website? Mm -hmm, okay. Exactly, yeah. Um, and the first meeting we had was just like a sushi date and we basically just discussed like very normal things, um, but he kind of portrayed that his interest in me was to take me to different parties and like play events where um, we'd be going to like dungeons and be doing like uh, very like hard BDSM stuff or not necessarily that I would be doing it, but um, we would be like attending as a couple. Okay. Like he basically like wanted a location where everybody's there for that reason. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, the first time that I went to one of those events with him, I was with there um, with another girl who was like 20 years old and I was 18 at that time. Um, the legal drinking age there is 19. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't able to drink, but the first thing that he did when we kind of got there was order, I think like four drinks. So two for me and two for the other girl. 
Um, and I wasn't like a heavy drinker at that point. So that got me pretty like buzzed. Mm -hmm. Um, so throughout that night, um, just imagine like a basement that's like kind of like a club, but everybody's in lingerie. Everybody's, um, like some people are kneeling on the ground with like collars around their neck. Um, some people are naked. Some people are having sex. Like it was just one of those environments that was very open to anything. How did you feel being there? Um, it was like very new to me. It mm-hmm. was very off-putting. Um, I didn't expect that at all. Yeah. I thought it was going to be like a normal club, but mm-hmm. everybody would just kind of have that shared interest. But it was very out in the open. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, like an hour into the evening, he tells me that I'm going to be on stage that night. So there was a stage in the middle of the basement that had like a cross basically um, that is used to like restrain people to. Um So, yeah, I didn't expect to have to do that, Um, but he made it very clear that that's what I was there for. So eventually he gets me up there. He tells me to get naked, um, except for like the high heels I was wearing. And then he put on a blindfold and kind of like restrained me against the cross. Um, And he started like using different implements to like hit me. in front of like probably like 150 people so he was hitting me and um using like paddles and like whips and different things like that and then he tells the girl that we came with to start using like her nail extensions or i don't know what they're called acrylic nails acrylic Mm -hmm. nails (laughs) yeah um to like scratch down my back but like in a very aggressive way So, um, she did that and my back was like bleeding. It was all blood and he was using a whip that had like metal tips to it. So my ass was like completely bloody as well. Um, and I just remember that the scene kind of ended and everybody was clapping around me. Um, but I just felt like completely numb basically, um, And then, like, one of the workers brought over, like, a towel to, like, clean myself up and a water bottle or something like that. And then he started doing the same thing to her next. Um, So, yeah, that was the first event that he took me to. And after that, he took me to, like, three more, which escalated, like, after that. I'm just, like... In general, like, it's just wild because it's like you had – I feel like you had the first experience with the one guy from Omegle. Mm -hmm. And now, like, this is a completely different person and honestly, like, a completely different experience. But I feel like the trauma level is, like, they're both Mm -hmm. really, really up there, but just in completely – two completely different ways. Yeah. I just feel like I was, like, preconditioned to, like, go into that because of the first guy. Right. Yeah. So, um, the second event I went to after that, um, it was kind of a similar situation. There was a lot of people there. A lot of them are older. It was like people in their fifties. Um, there was a lot of couples, a lot of people who were like swingers basically. Um, and at that event I got like suspended, um, from the ceiling and he whipped me again. But at that event, um, Basically, blood was big no-no. You weren't allowed to break any skin because it was against, like, the violations Mm -hmm. of that place. So he kind of got reprimanded at that place, but um, it didn't stop him too much. It just made him, like, look for different events that were more accepting of, like, bodily fluids Mm -hmm. and, like, more risky places, basically. And more, like, intense forms of abuse, too. Exactly, Yeah. yeah. Like, so, less limitations, I feel like. Like, it mm-hmm. it goes from, like, I feel like a light – more of, like, a light fetish to, like, mm-hmm. harm. Yeah, exactly. 
because for a lot of the things that he was doing to me, like I would have bruises and cuts and stuff like that for like two weeks after. So I'd be sitting in class sometimes just in complete pain. Mm -hmm. And for him, it was just like, 30 minutes of hitting me. Like right. he doesn't have to go through the after effects of feeling that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so for the third event, um, it was a similar situation, but he escalated it to basically put these metal um, clothes pins like all over my body. Like pinching um, your skin? Yeah, exactly. Like dozens and dozens of them. And this was already after, like, hitting me for maybe an hour. So my pain tolerance is already, like, dwindling. And then he did this on top of it, and um, I actually passed out. So there was, like, three dozen people around me, and I just completely fall to the floor, black out. Um, and when I wake up, there's like three very concerned older men around me who were like the monitors of that event. And they were really mad at the man that I came with because it was never supposed to get to the point of like me passing out. That's when the man that I came with kind of got like he was pushed to the edges of that community basically because people didn't like that he had gotten to that point and hadn't like exhibited the proper safety precautions. Mm -hmm. um, but the final event I went to him, went with him to, um, he actually had hosted it and like people were paying like significant amounts of money to come to these events um, specifically because they knew that like I was going to be there and the girls that I was with were going to be there and they wanted like an opportunity to see us either getting like hurt or um, in this next scenario, like performing sex. So that so they were paying more probably because they knew they were going to see what these other places wouldn't allow kind of mm -hmm. thing. You think? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So this specifically, this specific facility he rented out had like no rules against having sex like without um safety measures mm -hmm. they didn't have any rules against blood getting everywhere like they just had no safety precautions um and that night he had also gotten me several drinks and stuff like that um and he told me that i was going to have to do a sex scene with the girl that i came with like in the middle of the room so he put blindfolds on both of us and then like basically like pushed us together and um, directed us like during the act to like perform oral sex on each other um, and stuff like that. And I feel like during that experience, it was kind of similar to the other things that I went through where I just kind of felt numb and detached and really dissociated. Um, but I feel like that pushed me past the brink in terms of keeping that relationship with that man. So after that night, I pretty much cut off ties with him. I think at that point, like my therapist was also starting to affect me because he was trying to reverse a lot of the conditioning that the original man had kind of internalized in me. So up until that point, I did believe that like women were less than men. I did believe that like my only worth came as like somebody who could provide sex or like sexual services to somebody else. Um, but when I began seeing a different side of that, that's when I started to kind of argue with the men that I was with a little bit more and kind of push back and stuff like that. So a lot of the clients I was seeing at that point started getting upset with me and um, there were just numerous occasions where a client that would normally be really nice and like happy to be with me um, would get like physical with me or like use um, drugs to drug me and then rape me 
because I wasn't okay with what they were doing. So after I cut ties with him, um, I pretty much completely got off the BDSM website and I stopped everything with that pretty quickly. Um, But I was still on like the escorting website and because I stopped the BDSM website, um, that kind of accelerated. So one of what I would consider like the rock bottom of that was a day um, when I saw three different men in the same day and it was just like back to back to back. And the physical like toll that took on me was something that really stuck with me for like weeks after. Because you were physical with all three of them or sexual, mm-hmm. okay. And it wasn't even that I was sexual with all three of them like in that way, but it was also like each a traumatic experience. Yeah. So I hadn't really experienced like the physical toll of being um, more like aggressively raped, I guess. Um, so because of that day where I had met with those three men, um, that was a complete turning point for me. And that was what I would consider my rock bottom. Um So from that day forth, I had canceled all the websites. Um, I went through a period where I blocked all the unknown messages from my phone and even deleted like all the male people off my phone um, because I just didn't want to talk to anybody that was a man. Mm -hmm. Um, And so after that... um, I started doing therapy more frequently and we started doing like deep trauma work and I realized that I had pretty complex PTSD and I also had like um, a dissociative disorder where like my coping mechanism for when I encountered anything really difficult was to just completely emotionally detach from that moment. Um, So... Yeah, after getting those diagnoses, I think that really set the pace for the treatment in my therapy, and it started to be um, really helpful. And so ever since then, which was like 2020, 2019, um, I've still been seeing the same therapist, and um, things have been progressing really well, and I've moved on from like my bachelor's and now I'm in a master's program. Congratulations. Yeah. So now I'm pursuing becoming a therapist, hopefully. Amazing. Mm-hmm. So through the work with the therapist, did he or yourself, did you feel like you wanted to kind of open up and tell your parents everything that had happened or? Yeah, that's actually something that just happened like two weeks ago. Really? Yeah. Like you just told them kind of all of it? Yeah, because... There's some, like, um, police and, like, legal stuff happening right now because I started to pursue that once I really felt like I had kind of um, dealt with everything emotionally. I felt like I could go to the police and report it. So that's all happening right now, and I'm Mm -hmm. kind of in the middle of that right now. Yeah, I mean, I think that's amazing. And I feel like the fact that you went through all this, and I feel like the fact that you – it's interesting because – Therapy is such a long process and it is something that I feel like – it's great, I feel like, too, that you found somebody that really, like, stuck with you and worked Mm -hmm. and worked with you and helped you through all of this. And obviously, it's – like you said, it's not a short process and it's something that I feel like in general, like, you have to continue to work work on and work through within yourself. But I think that it's really amazing that I feel like through what you – or what you went through can kind of inspire you to want to help others because, one, you have – the personal experience, mm-hmm. you know, and two, I feel like firsthand you see how much work it takes, you know, within yourself and just even finding somebody that really cares and listens because I feel like that's hard to find in a therapist, like mm-hmm. somebody that makes you feel heard and really is, is patient with you through your whole process. Um, so yeah, I think that that's incredible. Yeah. And there's something I actually want to say about go that. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, So the reason I wanted to come on here is because I feel like there's a lot of misconceptions about how people respond to like a traumatic event or even just like a significant grief event that somebody goes through. And a lot of people who do go 
through like childhood abuse or childhood trauma um, usually will react by like um, partaking in like hypersexuality maybe and like going into sex work just because it is like trauma repetition and trauma reenactment is like very, very common among those people, yet there's still such a stigma um, against people who do that. So I think I just want there to be a lot more understanding around why people might react the way they do to their life circumstances. Yeah. And um, I think people shouldn't ask like why somebody's doing it, but just like come from a place of understanding. Absolutely. Yeah. And like I said too, like I feel like your story on its own will be able to relate to and help a lot of people, not only that you will personally help down the road on this career path, but also the people that listen, obviously. Um, Because like, you know, not everybody's story is going to be the same. But in general, I feel like if someone was in a position where they felt like their actions were being controlled or they sought out that attention, like I feel like I feel like that's so much more common. Like, obviously, your Mm -hmm. story and situation is very, very intense Mm -hmm. and heavy. But, like, there's so many people, like, even myself included, that it's, like, you seek that, like, attention and that validation. Like, whether it's from, like, men or even, like, more of, like, a motherly figure. Mm Because it could go either way. So many different ways. Um, And I feel like that's something that not enough people kind of realize of, like, why – in your situation, you might have pursued that. You know, somebody mm-hmm. might look at that and be like, well, she knew what she was getting into or the way that she, the way that he spoke to her, like she should have seen the red flags. Mm-hmm. But like when you're in those moments and you feel these like, these lacks of attention and even like, of, like you want this void to be felt, like, you know, filled within yourself, that's not what you're thinking about. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're, you're only taking the good out of the bad. Like there could be mm-hmm. a, a whole bad, you know, thing that you might see and realize, but when you're, filling something within yourself that's just so like you know it's just missing I feel like Mm -hmm. you just don't look at those things so I feel like like what I was just saying was just that I feel like people should also kind of see that route and that's why I feel like people can relate to your story even if it isn't the exact same experience Mm -hmm. in so many different ways and I'm like I said I I feel like you're gonna help so many people too and be able to really connect and relate and make people feel heard because that is so important especially in a therapy career and, and everything along those lines so you're going to do incredible things for sure. Oh, that's so nice. <laughs> of course. No, I'm serious. I, I really do mean it. And I think that you're so strong for co- being able to come on here and tell your story. And that says so much about you and your strength as a person. And I'm so proud of you. You did amazing. And Aww. I really hope that I hope that you I hope that you enjoyed it. And it was like it was good for you, like a way like kind of like therapeutic for you to be able to like mm-hmm. talk about it and just know that you're going to a lot of people will listen and and feel heard as well. And you'll help a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Hey, guys. We're always looking for ways to improve the show, and we would love to get to know you guys better. So if you could just take a few minutes and tell us a little bit about yourselves by filling out the audience survey in the description down below, that would be great. Thanks for supporting.